What most people are triggered by is their emotional system when they're making a, dis a decision about which politician to vote for, right? Uh, Barack Obama is tall and he's lanky and he's majestic and he seems presidential. Now, it might be that every single syllable that he utters is a bunch of platitudinal platitudinous nonsense but boy i am drunk simply by smelling the cork that's an arabic expression by the way getting drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle right on the other hand let me now smell the cork of trump oh he's disgusting he's an ogre he speaks in a cantankerous manner i didn't say anything about his policies of which i might agree with every single one of them i only used my affective system to 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 make a decision about whether i love barack obama or justin trudeau or or Donald Trump. And so I think one of the ways that we can inoculate ourselves against a lot of these parasitic idea is to make sure that we're triggering the right system at the right time. Welcome to another episode of Counterculture, the show that stands at the intersection of reason and faith in the battle against sentimentality and preservation of Western civilization. In 1841, Charles McKay wrote a book entitled Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, which was a collection of historical anecdotes about man's susceptibility to hysteria and other frailties. 180 years later, Gad Saad wrote a book entitled The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. What, if anything, have we learned about discerning the magnitude of crises and modulating our responses accordingly over those 180 years? Based on what we saw from the mass of humanity during COVID, I would say not much. Based on what we see from the cultural nomenclatura on issues like climate change, I would say not much. Based on what we see from the identitarian hustlers, I would say not much. Or maybe it's just the case that the human condition doesn't really change that much, and all cliches being true, there's a sucker born every minute and someone poised to make money by duping them. To help us sort all this out, since Charles McKay was not available, is Gad Saad. Gad is the host <laughs> of the popular YouTube show, The Sad Truth, uh, The Saad Truth, and a blogger for Psychology Today. He's also a professor of marketing at Concordia University in Montreal and a former holder of the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption, ironically, Darwinian Consumption was the name of my college garage band. It was a Fine Young Cannibals tribute band. We, we used to kill with our rendition of She Drives Me Crazy, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Hopefully this episode will quickly evolve from my feeble attempt at humor to Gad Saad's entertaining insights into the human psyche, including the truth about happiness, which is the topic of his latest book right here. Gad, thank you for joining us again. We appreciate it. Well, joining me again, first time on the podcast, but we've talked on the radio many times. Appreciate having you. Thanks so much. Oh, it's so good to be with you. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. I hope to be able to live up to it. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, so so what about that? The, the sort of the human psyche and so our, our politics and culture, and this is not a partisan statement, but our politics and culture that in 21st century West, in the 21st century West seems to careen from one mass hysteria to the other, doesn't it? Or do we just not have the historical context to appreciate it? You know, I, I think I, I very much like the fact that you juxtaposed, you know, 180 years ago to today because it speaks exactly to the fact that the capacity for human minds, so to use my language, to be the human minds to be parasitized is invariant across cultures and across time periods. The only thing that changes, and I say this with, with, with much regret, the only thing that changes is which idea pathogens parasitize us, right? So what is unique about the, the, the current zeitgeist is that now we're being parasitized by postmodernism, by cultural relativism, by identity politics, by political correctness, by social constructivism. And so those are unique to the current period, say, as compared to the, the, the gentleman that you mentioned 180 years ago. But the fact that we are susceptible to being parasitized, that will always be part of the human uh, reality. So, so how do we, if, if we know this about ourselves, like, you know, it's like one of these, if, if I know I have this susceptibility or this failing, then 
how do I inoculate myself? Or how do uh, I have a friend who says, you know, hey, if you're if you're behaving obnoxiously, you're the guy who's going to tell me I'm being obnoxious. So if I'm getting hysterical, somebody needs to be around to tell me I'm hysterical. How, how do we address what we know is our susceptibility? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. And towards the end of the parasitic mind, I offer uh, a mind vaccine. I offer a, a way a cognitive inoculation against some of this imbecility. So it, a general kind of philosophical, psychological way to answer the question is the, in the following way. Uh, it's wrong to always pit, are we reason animals or are we feeling animals? Is it reason or feelings that dominate? The reality is that we are both. The challenge is to know when to trigger which system. So if I'm walking down a dark alley and I see four young men loitering around, I will get an affective based response. My blood pressure will go up. My heart rate will increase. That affective response makes perfect sense in that given context. It is evolutionarily relevant. So the fact that it triggered my affect rather than my reason makes sense. On the other hand, if I'm trying to solve, uh, do well on a calculus problem, triggering my affective system is not going to help me much. I need to trigger my reasoning faculty. Now, why am I saying all this? Because let's apply it, say, to choosing who's going to lead us. Well, you would like to think that it is in that context, it's my cognitive system, it's my reasoning that's going to be triggered because it's a very important consequential decision and therefore I should put on my big boy pants to be able to make an optimal decision. Yet regrettably, as we both know and as most of your audience would know, what most people are triggered by is their emotional system when they're making a, de a decision about which politician to vote for, right? Uh, Barack Obama is tall and he's lanky and he's majestic and he seems presidential. Now, it might be that every single syllable that he utters is a bunch of platitudinal, platitudinous nonsense, but boy, I am drunk simply by smelling the cork. That's an Arabic expression, by the way, getting drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle, right? On the other hand, let me now smell the cork of Trump. Oh, he's disgusting. He's an ogre. He speaks in a cantankerous manner. I didn't say anything about his policies, of which I might agree with every single one of them. I only used my affective system to 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 make a decision about whether I love Barack Obama or Justin Trudeau or or Donald Trump. And so I think one of the ways that we can inoculate ourselves against a lot of these parasitic idea is to make sure that we're triggering the right system at the right time. It was said a lot during COVID that uh, one of the one of the issues with uh, Foley do or Foley 330 million is that uh, the the hysteria happens in a, a group uh, dynamic happens uh, in big numbers quickly. And then sort of the deprogramming happens one at a time. So trying to pull people back from uh, the uh, intellectual abyss is a an individual by individual uh, exercise, whereas you have people running to the cliff in mass. And so, you know, and, and what that time frame is, is uh, difficult to know. And it turns out to be difficult to game plan because there's so much uh, public policy impact in terms of how the hysteria happens and then how quickly the pullback occurs. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it, related to your point, you, you've probably heard the old adage. I'm going to butcher it. I don't remember the exact term, but the a lie has time to you know travel 10 times around the world before the truth wakes up in the morning or something to that effect. Yeah, Meaning it gets that its pants the, on, right. Right, so the, the virality of some mimetic transmission by the inherent structure of that meme allows it to tr travel much further. And so to your point, uh, it becomes very easy if let's say you're using a fear-based approach. We're all going to die from COVID. We're all going to die. We have 14 seconds left because AOC, as I like to call her occasional cortex, but apparently <laughs> yeah, Michael right. Savage has independently also called her that. I only That's found good. this out after Right. Occasional cortex. Right. Uh, so, you know, she says, you know, we've got, what, 12 minutes. Probably we're not going to get through this podcast because we're all going to die. And so fear works. As someone who studies consumer behavior, there are many contexts where a fear based appeal is going to 
draw the attention of consumers, right? We face all this perceptual clutter in a day. And if you could somehow trigger my emotional system, in this case, via fear, I'm going to pay attention. So you're exactly right that it's there is an asymmetry between how some of these informational flows happen. And as you said, sometimes I will sit at a cafe for 45 minutes trying to convince someone. Then when I leave, I'm pissed because I said, was it really worth my time to waste this much time to try to convince this singular person? But the reality is it is cultural trench warfare. All bets are off. Just do your part. Don't diffuse the responsibility onto others. And, and the, the fear mechanism. I mean, one of the things that's frustrating is even when those purveyors of phony fears or fears that were no, nowhere near the magnitude that they suggested they were, even when they're proven wrong over and over and over again, uh, wh whether it comes to you know COVID uh, guarantees or proclamations or it comes to the dire predictions associated with global warming, even when they're wrong over and over again, you know, some people you still you still see some people that just will not address the fact that here, just in black and white, this person said this was going to happen. We're now past that point. It didn't happen. And yet they still won't walk their position back. And, and I just wonder if you have any sort of insights into the, the psychic or psychosis that, that is associated with that behavior. Oh, boy, do I ever. So, and as a matter of fact, just I think it was two days ago, I appeared on a show hosted by a British psychiatrist. And at the end of the show, he asked me a, a question that I've rarely been asked before, but I thought it was it was such a good question that's going to speak exactly to what you just raised. He said, in all of your decades of being, you know, a evolutionary psychologist, a behavioral scientist, what is the thing that has most surprised you about human nature? And so I paused for a second and then I quickly converged to, to the following answer, which exactly speaks to your question, which is, I am amazed at people's unwillingness to deviate from their original anchored position, even if I drown you in evidence to the contrary. And and so, and, and again, it, 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 it only surprised me because as my mother used to tell me when I was a kid, she, she used to say, you know, God, you better learn quickly that the world doesn't abide by your purity bubble. And what she means there is something that I'm exactly answering now, which is I come into these exchanges, into science, into debates with a open heart, which is, hey, you may alter my position, in which case kudos to you, or hopefully I may alter your position. But the reality is most people are walking around all day going, la, 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 I don't want to hear anything you've <laughs> right. got to say. Right. And, uh, by, and by the way, just so I can kind of close that loop with an evolutionary angle, there is, uh, and I actually had one of the two authors on my show, there are these two French cognitive psychologists who wrote a book about the faculty to reason and why did it evolve? Why, why do humans have the capacity to reason? And they said with great regret, I think, that our ability to reason did not evolve to achieve some objective truth, but rather it evolved to win arguments. Boy, that's a that's a disillusioning statement because it basically says that it doesn't matter how well I construct my scientific arguments to convince you, Dan, if you're not willing to listen and if all you want to do is win arguments, then anything I say, you're going to be invisible to it. Um, so, so related to this, because I talk about this a lot uh, in Chicago about, you know, the people that just want to be fed beautiful lies about the city. Uh, you know, if you talk about the murder rate or you talk about the city's finances, then, you know, that's fear porn. Uh, you're running down this great city. Look at the lakefront. It's so beautiful. Uh, look at the Cubs. They may make the playoffs occasionally. Uh, you know, focus on the positive because I'm here. I, I don't want to hear it. And one of the things I wonder is if that's a coping mechanism, because I don't want to hear things negative about a place that I have either chosen or can't leave or for whatever reason. And so I don't want to. And, and also, and this is a key point, this is something that Eric Hoffer would bring up all the time in his work about mass movements is that if I don't feel like I have like I can impact the situation, then I want to hear even less about it, because then it just breeds a fatalism that I don't want to indulge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with that. Uh, and, and there are, again, 
psychological findings that support what you're talking about. So on a related note, let me uh, mention the following brilliant finding. Regrettably, it's not me who came up with it, it's someone else. Uh, so if you look at attributional styles, do I attribute something to my doing or to the environment? So it's very much related to what you're talking about. So people tend to, on average, attribute successes internally and failures externally, right? So I did well on the exam because I'm a really smart guy who studied hard. I did poorly on the exam because uh, Professor Saad is an asshole and he's so unfair, right? <laughs> now, yeah, now the right. only people, so that's a coping mechanism, right, so to right. your point, right? So, so the architecture of the human mind is such that it is trying to attribute events in one's world to protect one's fragile ego. Now, the only people, then who don't suffer from this rosy attributional style are clinically depressed people. Now, it could be that they are inherently less likely to have this rosy style, which makes them more likely to become depressed. And or it could be that once they become depressed, they simply see the world in the more realistic manner that the rest of us don't. But it exactly speaks to your point. There are all sorts of ways that we engage in self-deception because otherwise navigating through the world would be too difficult to do. Well, as I said uh, at the outset, all cliches are true. Ignorance is bliss. Right. <laughs> to, 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 to understand man's uh, sort of standing condition is to be constantly depressed and disappointed. And and to that point in chapter, I think, six of the parasitic mind, the chapter is titled Paras Ostrich Parasitic Syndrome. Well, what, what is that about? Right. It's it's the metaphor of the ostrich burying its head in the sand, even though it doesn't actually do that. But we all understand that to mean la la la. I want to ignore reality. And so I use it in the con. I, I mean, I, I demonstrate OPS, ostrich parasitic syndrome, in many contexts, but I spend the most time describing it in the context of what did people attribute the 35,000 plus terror attacks in nearly 70 countries since 9-11 alone? And of course, there is a very clear answer as to what caused these 35,000 plus terror attacks in 70 countries, but here are some of the uh, coping reasons that people came up with. These are real. These are This is not God sat satire. These are referenced actual reasons. Well, it's because of lack of art exposure that people commit these terror acts. Right. Because which of us didn't decide to go and join ISIS and Raqqa, Syria and throw those gays off rooftops because we weren't exposed to enough Dali? Right. That's a clear causal link. Yeah. Right. Not enough Dali causes joining ISIS. Here's another one from our good friend Bill Nye, the science guy. Oh, terror attacks are very much caused by climate change. Right. They're not the Bataclan attack in Paris was because of solar panels. You can go and watch him talk this stuff on Huffington Post. So what is happening there? I can either say that it what the true motive of those thirty five thousand attacks are. Or I could come up with all sorts of gibberish, insane nonsense. To Oh, it was due to beard bullying, by the way. Did you know that the San Bernardino attack was due to the fact that the guy had a long beard and he was being bullied as an employee at work? Of course. Look, that's why I never let my beard grow longer, because if I let <laughs> it grow to too bullied. long, it, it's just, I'll be bullied and therefore I'll join ISIS. And so <laughs> that's the kind of... And by the way, that's why I love to study human nature, because... Yes, we have the infinite capacity to get to the moon and map the human genome, but we also have the capacity to be parasitized by some of the biggest gibberish you could think of. Well, it's funny you mentioned that example, too, because, I mean, uh, you literally had it rises to the presidential level. Uh, at the same time, you had President Obama, then President Obama, saying, you know, we need uh, to get jobs for these young men. We need a, a, a jobs for terrorist program, and that will prevent young men from joining ISIS and Al Qaeda and uh, Al Shabaab and all the other terrorist organizations, too. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a job. For, and and you, you listen to it, uh, uh, you know, as somebody who's not criminally insane, and you say, who believes this stuff? But apparently someone like Obama has much better insight into the human psyche than, for example, I do, because there are people who do nod their head when somebody says that. Exactly. And by the way, and so does, please, listeners, pray for my well-being. I live in Canada where I'm under the dictatorship <laughs> of the noble progressive Justin Trudeau. Uh, yeah. Justin Trudeau said that, it, you know, why do these men do these things? It's because they're marginalized. 
right? So, so for example, Osama bin Laden, who comes from a billionaire family, was marginalized. Why else would he do what he did? And so, so yes, it's insane. And I, I'm doing my small part to try to fight against the tide. But boy, it's a long, drawn out culture war. Something else I want to get your perspective on as an evolutionary psychologist, um, and this was brought to my attention by someone you probably know, uh, Theodore Dalrymple, uh, that's a pseudonym. He's a, a, a retired now prison psychiatrist from across the pond in England, brilliant guy, really enjoy his writings as I do yours. And one of the things he said during COVID, one of the, the um, uh, psychoses that was in play was for Son. And the point is uh, that people were overcoming a fear, feeling like they're overcoming a fear where there really is no threat. And so, uh, so yeah, I, this is not to say that people didn't die from COVID and so on and so forth, but these like the, the hardcore COVIDians that were demanding you stand in your idiot circle six feet apart from your neighbor and with the masks and the shields and then the shields over the masks and another mask on the shield. And uh, so it, it's an irrational fear but they feel like they're accomplishing something. Like, you know, we're in this together, and if we, we, we stick together and we do all the mitigations, then we're going to defeat COVID. And then if I live to the other side of it, we can declare victory. Together, we defeated COVID, and I was an important part of that, providing leadership in my circles of influence. And it's all sort of manufactured, you know, the response to the threat and then the feeling of victory, but that people need to feel like they're overcoming something, even if it's something relatively modest. Sure. So in, in my latest book on happiness, I, I kind of address what you're asking in, in one of several ways. So the idea of having purpose and meaning in your life is, is obviously a foundational element of living the good life. I talk about it in the context of, you know, finding the right job that grants you that purpose and meaning. But to your point, uh, I have another chapter where I talk about the something that the ancient Greeks knew well, you know, the, the old maxim, everything in moderation. I right. demonstrate in an, in an entire chapter that, you know, pretty much anything that you could think of involving humans at the at the cellular level, at the neuronal level, at the individual level, at the societal level, follows that inverted U, meaning too little of something is not good, too much of something is not good, and the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Aristotle talked about it in the context of uh, a soldier. If they're if they're too cowardly, that's not good. If they're too brave and reckless, they'll going, they're, they're going to quickly die. And so, so there's somewhere in the middle that's the modulated, correct sweet spot. Now, how do I apply that to COVID? Obviously, if I never... Uh, you know, took any uh, preventive or precautionary measures and, you know, was completely reckless in, in how I behaved. It was a virus, not nearly as, you know, dangerous as people made it out to be. But if I truly was on the too little part of the curve, that would not have been good. If I am as many of, as you said, the COVID uh, folks, the, the hysterics were at the other end of the curve where, you know, uh, you don't leave the house, wear 17 hazmat suits, you know, wear a mask when you're alone in your car. Uh, they were at the wrong end. Somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot. And one of the things that I think is very powerful about that chapter is that I demonstrate that that insight, which the ancient Greeks were already well aware of, applies to nearly everything you can think of, Dan. So I'll give you one other quick example. Perfectionism follows an inverted U shape. If you're not the least bit perfectionist, say as an author, then your work will suffer. You don't have any attention to details. If you are at the other end of the curve where I lay, I'm too much of a perfectionist, then galley proofs yet again, because God forbid there might be a typo that's there or maybe a comma is out of place. Well, I could have spent my time doing much more productive things rather than reading the book yet yeah. another time, right? So there is a sweet spot somewhere that applies everywhere. God, you, you froze up there just when you talked about I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, of being oh, a no, perfectionist. That's... Can you just repeat that? Yeah. Yeah. So I regrettably am at the other end of the spectrum of perfectionism and that I'm maladaptively perfectionist so that when I receive the galley proofs of my latest book, I will spend weeks obsessing over it to make sure that there isn't a typo out of place, that there isn't a comma somewhere. Well, that's that's misplaced energy, because even if there is a typo, I could have spent my time doing more productive stuff. So everything that you could think of is likely to follow the inverted U shape, including our response to COVID.
Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's what Aquinas said, which was nothing is intrinsically good or evil, but its manner of usage may make it so. It's sort of the, the same philosophy. It's how you, I mean, not people or character, but in terms of objects in the world, how you access and use them. I wanted to get, I mean, since I'm, this is good because, um, you know, if you, I can think if you get a better understanding of the you know, of human beings frailties, then you're going to be more charitable. Um, and I, I need to be more charitable. So this is helpful to me. Uh, it's very difficult. But one of the other frustrations in the public policy arena, which is where I mostly operate, is the disconnect between inputs into something and what that something produces. And you could talk about many examples of this, but you know where I'm going. It's, it's we're going to spend money on something because it's the right thing to do. We should be helping people who are less fortunate. And so that's why I support uh, uh, this government agency and the taxation they extract from me to fund this government agency. But then when it comes to the outputs, are we really helping to get people out of their their situation? Are we helping them to live more independent, fulfilled lives? And the answer is no, there's just not the level of interest there is on the arguments with the, uh, the as compared to the arguments on the, the front end, which is how much are we gonna spend? Why is that? Well, that, that's one of the reasons I so appreciate Thomas Sowell, as I suspect many of your listeners yeah. and viewers would, right? Because he is, first of all, he's the original slayer of woke stuff when most of us were not even born or were, were in diapers. But he's a data guy, right? He, he says, here, let me, let me present to you the data, and then you can make up your mind. The problem, as you said, many public policy decisions are multifactorial in nature, meaning that there is an endless number of factors that, come, that could come into play in terms of affecting the, you know, that particular dependent variable. And so what ends up happening is that because most people are not scientifically minded, they're not evidence-based thinkers, there is an endless number of ways by which I can spin this to demonstrate that my policy was right versus those mean Republicans, their policy was wrong. Imagine if we're able to teach everyone to truly adhere to the scientific method, to evidence-based thinking, uh, to critical reasoning, then we might be able to adjudicate some of these decisions in a much more effective manner. But regrettably, there's so much noise that it becomes very easy for any politician to demonstrate that that which he did is right and that which his evil predecessor did is why we are facing the inflation that we are today. Yeah, you know, uh, actually, since you brought up Sol, he's got this great thought experiment that he wrote once. He said, imagine this, um, you're a politician and you have limited resources and you have to make a choice. Should we spend the money that we have on a statue to Benedict Arnold or should we spend it on child vaccinations, you know, for tuberculosis and other communicable diseases? And the answer is, of course, spend it on the statue for Benedict Arnold. And people say, wait, what? No, well, you spend it on the statue for Benedict Arnold because you're going to get the money for the childhood vaccinations too. So you get the money on the front end that you spent and then you demagogue, how could you not spend money on childhood <laughs> vaccinations? And that's how you run up $33 trillion in debt. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I'm often asked by people, why, why don't you get into politics? You know, you, you've, you've got the right skill set. And then I tell them, I don't have the right skill sets because I'm, I'm honest, I don't cheat, I don't scam, I don't spin. I would be the worst politician in history. So it, it's regrettable that usually the people who decide that, yes, I want to be a parasitic politician are exactly that. They're parasites who are void of honesty. I want to get your uh, perspective on something else that came up um, just uh, in the, the last day or so. So a um, friend of Bob Woodson, actually, we just had Bob Woodson on the podcast, oh, Woodson Center. He's invited to participate in a symposium at the University of Wisconsin at Madison that's uh, sponsored by a law professor there named Ryan Owens. The symposium is called Black Conservatism, the Past, the Present, the Future. That doesn't seem to be like a particularly uh, enraging title to a symposium, but apparently it was to some. So part of the conference was a Zoom conversation. Somebody hacks into the Zoom conversation, starts using epithets in the direction of the academics and, and, and activists like Bob that were part of this discussion. Then um, before they are able to cut off the Zoom, to cut off this interloper, pulled down his pants, began masturbating. 
What? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. And it wasn't Jeffrey Tubin. This was this was just <laughs> just some some producer. And 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 so I just I look at this these these incidents of how these um, you know new Marxists or whatever you would call them neo Jacobins leftists whatever you would call them the, the stick you know the gluing yourself to the floor of an NBA basketball game or the tennis tournament um, this sort of activity the you know accosting people in restaurants um, I mean like you know what. How does somebody like that get triggered to behave in such a barbaric way? Is there an answer to that question? Yeah, so, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So one of the things that I often talk about is the difference between uh, and 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 after I answer this, I want to give you an even crazier example of a cancel story that just happened. But bear with me. Uh, so I talk about the distinction between deontological and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics would be, you know, it is never okay to lie. It's an absolute statement. Uh, consequentialist ethic would be, it is okay to lie if I'm trying to spare someone's feelings. Now, for many things, we walk around through life being consequentialist. That makes perfect sense. But there are other things where there has to be foundational principles that are deontological, presumption of innocence, freedom of inquiry, freedom of speech, uh, you know, whether it is okay to masturbate in public or not should be a deontologically <laughs> agreed upon statement. And I, I think hope. What, uh. Right. So what happens to a lot of the people that you mentioned is that they, they are very much consequentialist in their uh, mindsets, which is all bets are off in the pursuit of whatever social justice goal I'm trying to achieve. And, and by the way, that's exactly what I argue unifies all of the idea pathogens that I discuss in the parasitic mind. They all start off with an otherwise noble goal, but that in the service of that noble goal, if I have to murder and rape truth, so be it, right? So I need to make sure that transgender people live free of bigotry, which I think most of us would agree. Well, in the service of that goal, I now I have to promulgate the message that yes, men too can menstruate and men too can bear children. Well, no, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. I could support that social justice goal without ceding an inch of truth in, in doing so. And now very quickly to the cancel story. I just did a sad truth clip on my uh, YouTube channel and podcast uh, recounting what just happened with the uh, American Anthropological Society and yeah. Canadian Anthropological society they canceled a session where i think it was six women scientists wanted to argue that there are many contexts in anthropology and in bioarchaeology where biological sex you know this thing with male and female is still important to look at they were canceled because that would be a form of erasing marginalized people so i hate to be the guy who told you so but here i am i told you so when i appeared in 2017 in front of the Kenyan senate i exactly predicted what just happened in the american anthropological society Right. I mean, it's the, the the end of science because everything is politicized and what's politicized is essentially destroyed. If you politicize something, you it's no longer about the truth. And so, I mean, it, the, the destruction is inevitable. What form it takes? Uh, well, it takes many forms. You know, it's interesting. Um, just a, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's on point. Even within, I mean, because this is within another scientific community, you probably remember this. I just read a piece about this um, over at March of Revolution blog, Tyler Cohen's blog, George Mason University. So uh, about um, eight years ago, there was a study that found that um, out of a hundred sort of uh, preeminently important psychological studies, only 60% could be replicated, right? 60% could be replicated. And the psych this uh, uh, psychologist is writing about this. You know, the funny thing about that is I, I ask people, well, what were the studies that couldn't be replicated? Na can you name any of the studies? Can you name any of the studies in, in the study, the meta, uh, the meta analysis? Can you name any studies that couldn't be replicated? Because you think that it's sort of important to our profession. And he's like, I, I, he's like I, and he's the first one to admit, I could name maybe one or two. My colleagues, zero, one, uh, more, m most of the answers. And it's like, it's such an odd thing. He, he analogized it this way. If you had a hundred relatives go down in a plane crash, would you ask about which 40% survived? 
Or would you just say, you know what? I, I never, I never thought to ask. I, I don't know who survived and who didn't survive. And but it's so all this talk about, and especially in the era of COVID, everyone is a man or woman of data and science, but they're not, including the scientists. And it doesn't even matter uh, if their their studies are reliable, meaning that they're rec uh, replicable. It doesn't even matter. It, it has no impact on their professional standing. It has no impact on what they do on a daily basis. It has no impact on policymaking. Well, think about, to, to, exactly to your point, Sean Carroll, the, the physicist at Caltech, and you know the brilliant physicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I don't think has ever published a single scientific paper in his life, both of them have come out recently greatly in support of the, you know, sex on a spectrum, gender right. on a spectrum. How could you not see that? That And it is delivered with such haughty smugness that, you know, um, you know, if you were one of the people who is susceptible to being parasitized, you would say, well, listen, if these astrophysicists are saying it, it must be true that men too can menstruate. So imagine that these guys are called scientists in the same way I'm called scientist. Well, I was more of a scientist when I came out of my mother's womb than, those two, <laughs> than these two idiots are today, right? But that's because they are parasitized, right? So they are not true interlocutors when it comes to truth seeking. Even someone as educated as them could be com a complete baffled, lobotomized imbecile. All right, so I wanna end on a happy note since, I mean, talking about the human condition, it's difficult to end on a happy note, but you wrote this book, The Sad Truth About Happiness, and you were mentioning it before. Um, living the good life, That's this is a question that's timeless. Uh, we explored it on this show with uh, Andrew Clavin just a couple of episodes ago, and he mm -hmm. gave a great answer that was you know, largely spiritually driven, but it was a really thoughtful, comprehensive answer. So, so you know, from uh, the perspective of an evolutionary psychologist, um, if not what living a good life looks like, what are the questions you should be asking yourself to examine whether you are? Uh, okay, well, I, there are several ways I could answer that. I can kind of go through all of the different uh, prescriptions, but let me just answer one of the chapters. I talk about the two most important decisions that you'll make that will either impart great misery or happiness, depending on whether you make the right choice or not. Number one, choosing the right spouse if I wake up next to the person next to me in the bed and I actually like this person, that I'm well on my way to being happy. If I then go off to a job that gives me great purpose and meaning, well, that's great. And then if I return to that person at night to sleep next to them and they make me happy, well, I've pretty much cracked the, the code of uh, the secret of, to life. And so now the question is, are there specific edicts that we can follow to try to maximize our likelihood of choosing the right job and choosing the right uh, spouse? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Let me briefly mention what they might be. Number one, in choosing the right spouse, there are two opposing maxims in evolutionary psychology. There's the opposites attract maxim and the birds of a feather flock together maxim. For long-term success of a marriage, it's overwhelmingly the case that birds of a feather flock together. On which feathers though? It's if we have shared values, shared belief systems, right? If, if I am very much rooted in my faith for everything that I make as a decision and you and my prospective suitor is a caustic atheist, well, it doesn't take a fancy evolutionary psychologist to suggest that we're off to on the wrong foot. Uh, in terms of choosing the ideal job, I say that any job that grants you the ability to instantiate your creative impulse, I could be a chef, I could be an architect, I could be a stand-up comic, I could be an author. All of those professions are very different, but what they share in common is they immer immerse me in the mystical process of creation. So all other things equal, when you create, that gives you purpose and meaning. The second thing that I would suggest you try to seek in your ideal job is something that grants you temporal freedom. Contrast my reality, which is I work very long days, but I'm always floating. I'm going from one th thing that interests me to another. I, there's nothing mandated typically in my day other than having meetings. I have to come and do this show now. Or compare that to someone who is a factory worker that, where the union tells them when they can take a bathroom break. That doesn't give you temporal freedom. So if you can instantiate your creative impulse and have temporal freedom while doing it, you're well on your way to being occupationally happy. And, and so, I mean, so it's a, sort of a combination of individual sovereignty, maximizing autonomy, but not living autonomously. Exactly. They, what, what, better, said better than I did. 
All right, all right, okay, good. Very good. Maybe I get like a a, a blurb on your next uh, your next book <laughs> or something like that. Um, so uh, other things that people don't consider, you know, a lot of people uh, will focus on obviously a mate and family and career, but are there other things that people should be thinking about um, that maybe are even counterintuitive when it comes to happiness and living the good life? Yeah, very good. Uh, so I'll mention two quick ones. Number one. Uh, I have a chapter on life as a playground, and I basically argue that it is truly regrettable that most people view play as something that you grow out of, right? So in the same way that you you know, you know, have baby teeth and then they fall out and then here comes your permanent teeth, people think of play as similar to your baby teeth. Yes, you play until a certain point, but then as an adult, life is serious, you don't play. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have an indelible need to play. Even in the Holocaust, people were playing. Even when I was in the Lebanese Civil War, I used to play outside where my parents would say, well, don't pass this imaginary line because then that would put you within the eyesight within the vision of the snipers who will then blow your brain. And so even in the most dire of circumstances, we need to play. And so even when I approach science, it's science is a form of intellectual play, right? You're trying to create a puzzle from all kinds of variables to see which one is correlated or causal, which other one, right? So living life as though it's a big playground is very important. In terms of counterintuitive, when you ask that, so later in the, in the book, I talk about, you know, try to live your life in a way that forestalls later regret. And here we have two types of regret. Here's kind of the surprising part. There are two types of regret. There's regret due to actions and regret due to inactions. Regret due to action would be, I regret that I cheated on my wife and that led to my divorce and the end of my family. Regret due to inaction is, I regret that I never became an artist. I became a pediatrician because my dad was a pediatrician. Well, it turns out that over the long haul, People's greater regret, the one that looms most in their psyche, are regrets due to inaction. And so I argue that if you live an authentic life, authentic not in the sense of being real in our daily interactions, that's also important, but if you live a life that is in accordance, that is congruent with your inner needs, your inner beliefs, your values, then you're much more likely to forestall regret when you're sitting on that porch when you're 85 years old. Uh, what about the spiritual piece of it, or at least in the sense of um, a belief that uh, there's something bigger than you? Because I, I, I just wonder if, if you don't have uh, that aspect of your intellectual makeup, then it's pretty, pretty easy to become what C.S. Lewis would call a man without a chest, just, just a, a vehicle for consuming uh, desires rather than, and, but, but sort of no way to tie them all up in a way that... Um, provides meaning to what you do. Yes. So what, yeah, what about so I, that piece of it? Well, I, your, your listeners might be interested uh, to know that there is a positive correlation, uh, albeit moderate one, not, it's not a very big one, uh, between religiosity and happiness, meaning that all other things equal, being religious on average makes people happier. Now, there might be very or there are very earthly reasons why that might be the case. In other words, it may not be because I'm actually connecting with, an, with a supernatural being. So for example, being religious affords me greater communality with, with, with people of the same faith. It offers me greater opportunities to engage in reciprocal arrangements with in-group members. And so there are very earthly reasons why religions, religions cater to my innate need for communion and bonding. That said though, I think that even if you're not religious, you can seek very spiritual experiences. So I'm often approached on the street by people who recognize me, and then I will have a serendipitous conversation with a complete stranger for the next 20 minutes that is truly awe-inspiring, that is truly spiritual. So I think that, yes, a direct pathway is through religion to seek that spiritual itch that we want to scratch. But even if you are irreligious, I think there are ways by which you can still live within an ethos of spirituality. Well, and, and that, that piece about communality, um, I, that was really on display during COVID. And I just, I just wonder if uh, you think per, perhaps the most cruel thing that was done that will have the most lasting impact that we can't even truly assess right now is the isolation of people and particularly children uh, from their classmates in school. I mean, you know, 
we knew we put we put uh, violent criminals in isolation as like exactly. maximum punishment right in a prison setting exactly. and that's and that's what we did to a free people during covid i've actually used that exact example about general population versus isolation so w well done uh look uh in, in, in the towards the end of the, the my book on happiness, I talk about the Harvard longitudinal study that's been going on for eight plus decades, where they've been studying what are the factors that affect well-being, whether it be physical well-being or mental well-being. And the you know, the number one most important factor is the quality of the social relationships in your life. So much so that I actually have a quote that says that the quality of your social relationships has a greater effect on even physiological markers like the health of your heart than your cholesterol level scores in your when you're 50, right? Uh, and so you're exactly right. We are a social species. We are terribly harmed if we are placed in isolation, whether it be under COVID or as you said, in the federal penitentiary, and we need to interact with each other. I, I have I hold a lot of Zoom meetings with people, but never am I more invigorated than when I get together with a friend, we go on a long walk, we can see each other, we can touch each other. We are meant to bond. He is God Saad, the new book, The Saad Truth About Happiness. Check out his uh, YouTube show, The Gad, uh, the Saad Truth as well. God Saad, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Counterculture. Continued success with the books. And uh, it was great talking to you, if even only by Zoom and not in person. Next time in person, if we can. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great chatting with you. Cheers. Thank you, Professor. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And please leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts.